Echo. Lima. Delta. Shield. You know, any other night I would hear that music and it would just be like, oh boy, here we go. But last night was the night that we got the shield back again. I'm totally okay with this and anybody that hates it, they can just shut their mouths. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this edition of The Game Changer. I'm indeed Nate the and Great and I'm being joined here by the master of the regret, the one and only Mr. Brian Zane. Thank you for being a part of this. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for having me back. And, uh, yeah, the shield returning was very interesting. I, you know, I thought one way about it, and I was talking with some friends about the implications of this. And then there's a lot of, you know, reports out there online and cynical people out there who have who think there's this ulterior motive and, you know, about why the shield's back together. And I think that's very, you know... It's easy to think that's the truth, and, you know, there might be some truth to it, but, um, you know, we can talk about it a little more. But the Shield returning was definitely the highlight of Raw on Monday, which is too bad, because it's a three-hour show, we had to wait to the very end to get a highlight. Yeah, and I know you'll definitely be talking a lot about that when you do your show on your channel, uh, Who Wore It Better, so guys, <laughs> definitely tune into that on, the YouTube, on his YouTube channel. Uh, but first off, let's get into talking about this past weekend. We had NXT TakeOver as well as SummerSlam. Once again, it seems like another bit of a head-to-head deal where it's NXT versus main roster WWE. Uh, What were your general thoughts about... uh, Let's start with uh, NXT. How did you feel going into the show, and how did you feel after watching the show? I go into every show I watch with absolutely zero expectations uh, because... I, I always like to, you know, so I basically keep my expectations low, that I'm always pleasantly surprised by the end, no matter what happens. Um, so, and, you know, NXT has a reputation that precedes itself, especially when it comes to takeovers. And of the takeovers, I feel Brooklyn's the one where they, um, you know, where they seem to really up the ante. But, um, you know, between NXT and SummerSlam, like, who wins? Well, WWE wins, because people are watching both shows. Uh, pretty pretty well. So, um, but NXT was great. I love Takeover. It was um, very a lot of very action packed. Like every match was like they tried to be the match of the night, and each match went about being the match of the night in different ways. Like I talked with R. Felix Finch, one of my contributors, about this, and he said, you know, you can make an argument for every match on the show being match of the night. Uh, and I think I agree with him. Every match was stellar. Uh, in ring stuff right now, no one. Can, I mean, no one in WWE in that in that umbrella can really match what NXT is doing. Yeah, it is very hard to match a lot of this, but sometimes they actually do find a way to either match it or surpass it. But uh, let me ask you also this: to a lot of the people that are sick and tired of seeing like repeat matches, like of course uh, we've had to deal with, you know. Orton and Cena so many times, and then we had, I think it was uh, CM Punk and Daniel Bryan so many times. Now it seems like we're getting the same thing with uh, Gargano and Ciampa. Almost, they've main evented all three of the past uh, takeovers. I personally don't find any reason to hate this. I mean, honestly, I compare it to like Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens, where it's like, even if they say it's the last match, the next matchup is still going to happen, and it's still going to be just as good. Um, but yeah, what are your thoughts on like the repeat of having Gargano and Ciampa main event NXT TakeOver? If there's still a reason to be invested emotionally, and if people are still into it, they can headline the next 18 TakeOvers. You know, it's, uh, I'm not saying that should happen, <laughs> but, uh, you know, if there's money to be made, and if there's network subscriptions to be bought with uh, a feud like that, then, you know, I say you milk that for all it's worth. Um, don't do, you know, don't do a thing where there's a rival that really only has but a one or two month run and then you just milk that to death and you go past the expiration date. Right now, the stuff with Ciampa and Gargano has been top notch stuff. Um, you know, I think everyone's kind of waiting for that inevitable, you know, Johnny Wrestling overcomes the odds and wins. But, 
you know, some, of the, some of the greatest rivalries in wrestling are notoriously one-sided. Uh, Tommy Dreamer and Raven's a great example of that, um, where Dreamer, except for one time, well after it mattered, uh, got and never got a win over Raven. So, you know, I think it's, you know, as much of a gut punch as it is to see Ciampa, you know, slink away with it every time. Um, you know, I think that what they're doing works. Yeah, I'm just hoping that, you know, they do, like you said, they add still the emotion, they add still the action to it, and obviously they're going to have to change the story sooner or later, probably when they get up to the main roster. One of my main concerns with uh, Tommaso Ciampa and Jar Gargano is that they're putting on such high-level main event uh, matches but they're going to end up probably on 205 Live competing for the Cruiserweight title, which isn't a bad thing. However, it feels like with the stories that they're creating, they are delivering stuff that could definitely be utilized better on the main roster. Yeah, I mean, I think that the main roster could take a cue or five from what NXT is doing in terms of storyline progression and development and stuff and character development. I think no one's doing long-term stories right now better uh, in terms of, again, in WWE, doing it better than NXT right now. And the stuff that they've done with Gargano and Ciampa for the last year plus has been a very good example of that. So, um, yeah, it, it will be a bit of a letdown when one or both of these guys get moved to the main roster. I hope for the time being they move to separate shows because, you know, the two of them on the same show and then, you know, however the main roster will alter their characters and their pushes in some ways will be disappointing. I think fans have to get, just prepare for that mentally. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sting because no one, no one ever comes out of NXT... No one ever comes out of NXT and goes into the main roster as strong as they were when they were in NXT. Uh, but they have to build up to it, basically. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, but, you know, for now, I think fans just enjoy the ride. Yeah, I think that's hard to disagree with. Uh, speaking of main roster, we, of course, go on to SummerSlam, the quote-unquote biggest party of the summer. Last time in a few years that uh, we will see them actually doing this in Brooklyn, uh, a lot of people have been giving rumors about what they're going to be doing next year. Uh, Toronto has actually been one of the names that has been laid out for SummerSlam next year. Nothing's been confirmed yet, but we'll see what happens. Uh, general thoughts on SummerSlam as a whole. Did you th- think the show was good? Do you think it was a flop? What do you think? I didn't think the show was good. I thought it was great. I really enjoyed the show. And again, this might have something to do with me and my low standards for... Uh, enjoyment, my, my low expectations, but yeah, I think really every match delivered in some way. I mean, the squash matches, I know people are kind of pissed about, um, but I think all but one of them served a purpose, told a story, like the story that needed to be told, um, to do it any other way than those squashes would have uh, been a detriment to the person who ended up winning. And uh, then there's people can play with the DQ finishes. Like, yeah, it would have been nice if the SmackDown tag title match ended with a proper finish. And yeah, it's always more satisfying to see a winner in the WWE Championship match. But at the same time, the Samoa Joe AJ Styles one definitely leads to a follow up match at Hell in a Cell where the stakes are even higher and things get even more personal and gritty. And, you know, I mean, you, you get yourself a rematch between New Day and Bludger Brothers. And I was really pleasantly surprised how that match turned out. Um, yeah, except, you know, the pre show matches I would factor into my overall enjoyment or grade of a show. Um, and the matches in the pre show were kind of a mixed bag. So I don't really count those, but everything else in the main show, I think, um, you know, the short the squash matches help make things paced better. I think that, you know, when you watch a show like New Japan, like when you watch Dominion or G1 Special or Wrestle Kingdom or whatever, every match is like a 10 to 15 to 20 minute bar burger match. And for me, by a match four or five, I'm exhausted. I don't have the time or the patience or the energy to wait and see what, you know, Okada and Omega and Naito and whoever do in the main event, because I'm already burned out from the shit they did in the undercard. So, um, with a show like SummerSlam being as long as it is, it's nice to have shorter matches like that, to break up the the pace, and to just, you know, keep things moving on a different way. So, there are some hiccups with the show. I think no show is going to be perfect, but I think how they managed to uh, tell some stories in SummerSlam 
was a was a good success. And again, it's, it's, it's impossible to compare to Takeover. It's unfair to compare to Takeover for a variety of reasons. Um, but you know, people will make their own opinions. I again between who between which which brand won. You know, main roster NXT, both of them won. In you know, retrospectives, I see the point you're definitely delivering there. And you also mentioned uh, Samoa Joe and AJ Styles. Uh, their matchup I definitely enjoyed. In my opinion, I thought that was match of the night based on the storytelling and the wrestling alone. I thought it was absolutely amazing. But one of the things I wanted to bring up is during the matchup, there was the dread chance that everybody, especially in WWE, would dread to hear. And that's the chance of TNA, TNA, TNA. I was one of those nostalgic guys like, oh, wow, they're actually doing it. This is awesome. I cannot believe they did that. And it also made me think back to the days when Samoa Joe and AJ Styles were working in TNA, Impact Wrestling, whatever they want to call it. Um, and just thinking back to that, day, back to those days where they were headlining so many great shows, and then you fast forward, they're headlining SummerSlam. I never thought that that would actually happen, but when they finally announced it, it was like this is actually happening. Holy cow. I never thought we were actually... We thought that the only time that they would actually have, like, a main event at a summer show would be Slammiversary. But it's really cool to see AJ Styles and Samoa Joe not only putting on one of the best matches on the show, but also one of the best stories on there. And you mentioned it. It's going to go into Hell in a Cell. I mean, people already leaked it online, which sucks, but it's one of those things where it's like, well, they make the right story and it makes sense, then it makes sense for them to headline that show... It's going to, but you also watched uh, Unbreakable a while back, and comparing, you know, that main event for the showing that, you know, Samoa Joe and AJ Styles had in that matchup to what they showcased on uh, at SummerSlam, did it surprise you after watching that Unbreakable matchup that Samoa Joe and AJ Styles would probably headline a big event like SummerSlam? Actually, headline SummerSlam after what I saw on Unbreakable. Right. Or, I mean, sure. I mean, anything's possible in wrestling. I mean, watching Unbreakable so recently and then watching them wrestle today, it's kind of like different. It's you know, it's 13 years later and their bodies are more broken down. Joe can't do half the stuff he used to do in 2005 because he beat his body up too much. And I think Styles is wisely, you know, slowed down some of his crazy stuff with age. You, I don't think you'll see him doing a springboard shooting star to the outside anytime soon. Um, but he does a lot of the stuff that's, you know, quote-unquote safe for him. Um, I, I think it was a, it's a testament to both guys that they were able to you know, uh, work as hard as they did to eventually get signed, and the way that the the cards fell, the way that fate would have it, they'd be lucky enough to have a marquee matchup at one of the biggest pay per views of the year. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it was just it was inevitable based on their hard work and their abilities. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I think it was definitely. I mean, it was one of the better matches of the night for sure. Um, and I think, like I said in my review about it on my YouTube channel, I think what made this matchup better than say AJ and Shinsuke at WrestleMania 34 was that these guys had so much better chemistry from working for so much longer longer ago. And also I think it helped that there was a face and heel dynamic as opposed to WrestleMania when it was, you know, face and face. Um, that is always difficult to overcome, uh, no matter who you are, how, how skilled you are. Uh, but yeah, so Joe and Styles is great, and uh, I can't wait to see what they do with them uh, in the future. Oh man, it's going to be absolute wrestling magic, guarantee it. Uh, one other thing, major highlight that happened at uh, SummerSlam was the fact that finally the Beast was dethroned at the main event. Yes, I'm going to have to say that the main event of SummerSlam. Roman Reigns is the new Universal Champion, and some people have mixed reactions to it, although there are some people that were actually cheering that Roman was winning because they thought that Braun Strowman was going to do the immediate cash-in on that. And I was listening to uh, another podcaster who uh, mentioned the idea of what WWE's plan probably was going into the main event matchup. They thought they were probably thinking that they have Braun Strowman out there. He's tempting the idea of doing the cash in deal, and then after Roman gets his big victory, people are going to think, "Oh, look, Braun's going to cash in." But then they just ended the show like that. Honestly, I think if that was their plan, smart strategy. I mean, it definitely did get people a moment where it's like, "Hey, we're cheering for Roman Reigns," but I guess after the cameras went off and they found out, nope, Roman's not getting cashed in on. They just started. <laughs> giving him nuclear heat, no surprise. But then, less than 24 hours later, he was getting cheered again. 
So, kind of a roller coaster ride for Roman Reigns in the last 24 hours plus. I mean, if there's one thing that today's wrestlers have to deal with more than anything, it's uh, mixed messages from the fans. Like, Roman Reigns especially doesn't know what to do because, yeah, it's like he'll get cheered and he'll get booed. And honestly, it's really hard to properly gauge why the fans are reacting this way. You know, I can't tell you the number of times I've seen fans online say, oh, the fans, they're booing the writing. Really? Like, how can you possibly... You convey that to me that sounds like whatever internal biases you have and you see it you hear the crowd do a response externally that goes in your head you like you you justify it or you rationalize it however you want to to you know correlate with your beliefs if you think the writing sucks and the fans are booing a wrestler like a heel, you know, and particularly a heel or something or they boo a match or whatever they think oh they're like me everyone goes on reddit like i do and they boo the writers well if that were the case and you should really you know do a chant like fire road dog or you know fire the writers fire rooster doesn't apply anymore even though it's kind of a universal sentiment uh so it's just one of those things where uh when people boo roman reigns they boo him, or do they boo the booking? You have to you, you have to survey every fan in attendance to figure out why you're reacting this way, and hear what people are explaining. Because it's really hard to explain in a few words why people don't like Roman Reigns. Anyone who says that he can't wrestle is, I think, they're lying to themselves, and they're just like trying to find ways to, you know, again, rationalize their hate. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, the story, the way he's been booked, unquestionably bad, <laughs> and so. Maybe they're trying to make good with it. But, yeah, he gets booed, he gets cheered. You know, when I heard he got cheered, when I saw he got cheered at SummerSlam, I was happy for him. And then I hear these people online saying, oh, they weren't cheering him because it was Roman. They were cheering because, oh, because Brock lost. Or, oh, because they thought Roman was going to cash in. To me, it's just making excuses. You know, like, you were, you know, if you're glad that Brock lost the belt, you know, then you are also happy that Roman won. <laughs> by definition. Um, so, I, again, it's, I think it's just more of the, the gnashing of teeth by a lot of a vocal minority of fans who just like to get mad. Yeah, I think that it, I, it boils down to what I've said all throughout this month is that wrestling is weird. Whether it's the fans, whether it's what's going on in the ring, whether it's going outside the ring, wrestling is just a bizarre thing and we just find enough, more than enough reasons to love it. I know that throughout you know your years you've definitely hit on a lot of, you know, stuff that some people either have looked at and thought, you know, this is complete garbage or stuff that's like, oh, this is really good, but then it's like, is it really or is it more nostalgia? Um, and definitely one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons why I do appreciate the work that you put in is that, you know, hey, you know, you like it for this reason, but have you ever considered looking at it on a different spectrum? And it's absolutely amazing. And obviously, uh, we talk about Roman Reigns, uh, we got to talk about what happened on Monday Night Raw, of course, uh, he had a great matchup with Finn Balor. Basically, he just said, well, Finn Balor never got a rematch, so let's give him a rematch right here tonight. And, of course, people are just happy. They're cheering. Then Braun comes out, and everybody's thinking, oh, we're going to get the cash-in. And we thought we were going to get that cash-in, but as I stated before, Shield's music hit. Here comes Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose, both coming out, and they beat down on Braun Strowman, gave a triple powerbomb through the announce tables. The Shield is together. And this was something that I thought was legitimately going to happen more at SummerSlam. I thought that they were actually going to have, maybe the referee takes a bump, Brock tries to beat down on Roman, then the Shield comes out, boom, maybe do like a triple powerbomb to Brock, one, two, three, that's it. But now they're doing it to Braun Strowman, which I think is actually really good because now this makes Roman one of those guys who's like, I do realize that Braun's going to be a credible threat. He's beaten me so many times in the past. I need the backup. So, let me ask you this. Does this make the Shield more of a heel faction, or are they just being more more smart? Kind of more like, you know, they're still good guys, but they're just trying to be smart with what they're doing. See, right now, I don't think we, any of us can answer that question until we see what happens on Raw next week, because I think they left it very open-ended. 
based on what we saw. Because we saw the Shield beat up a, an established, you know, true blue babyface, the guy who everyone almost universally cheers, trying to cash in. It's like a second time trying, and then due to some extenuating circumstance, isn't able to cash in. And people know once he does cash in, you know, it's it's on. And so uh, this time the Shield comes out to protect Roman Reigns. They beat him up. They power bomb him. And that, to me, signifies a heel turn. But the commentary made it sound neutral at best. And wow, the shield's back, guys! Yay! At, at you know, at worst, in terms of portraying it like a babyface thing. So the question we have to see the answer to next week is: Are they going to go keep going down the road with this and make them more heelish, or are they going to try and be more tweener or, God forbid, babyface still? Because if that's the case, then it would confirm the the rumor and the innuendo going on right now that the Shield is back together for the reason that they did the reuniting late last year, or, yeah, late 2017, was to protect Roman Reigns and to get people to cheer Roman Reigns, um, which in the short term worked last time. And so it seems to happen again Monday. Will that turn into more heel stuff? Because I'd love to see Dean and Seth become bad guys and like be stooges to Roman Reigns. That would be my choice for where this goes. But if, if you believe the online scuttlebutt that this is trying to protect him and make him more of a baby face or like trying to get, they're, they're, they're trying to use how much over Seth and Dean are and rub that off on Roman, then we might have a bad time. Well, we'll just wait until Monday. But until then, we also have quite a bit going on, guys, in the forthcoming weeks, too. We have. All in coming up in Chicago, it, actually just next weekend. It's absolutely amazing how fast that's coming up. But also coming up very soon is something that you created uh, a few years ago. It was the Internet Darlings. Uh, a few years ago, you created it, and you brought on a lot of uh, YouTube personalities, wrestling personalities. Uh, most notably, I remember Grimm's Toys Show, as well as What Culture were a part of it. And now this year, you have uh, UK Boogaloo, which will be taking place in the United Kingdom, and it will feature uh, guys from Wrestle Talk, Cultaholic, as well as Botchamania. So, from not giving away maybe too much spoilers, what can people expect at uh, UK Boogaloo Internet Darlings 2? Well, first of all, I'm flattered that you would use All In as a segue to talk about my show coming up, because they are two very different things. Uh, (laughs) But, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm very excited, because last year in Orlando, we did Internet Darlings 1, and that was a big success. It was a giant headache, and I almost thought I was never going to do it again. But, um, yeah, it's coming up. It's the weekend after All In. It's uh, September 8th in Manchester, England, the Bowlers Exhibition Center, as part of Wrestling Media Con happening there the 8th and 9th. And, yes, uh, Matthew from Botchamania, Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic, and uh, the lads from Wrestle Talk, Luke and Ollie, will be a part of it as well. And, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, it's uh, we only have an hour to work with. I just, like, found out yesterday with the lineup looking at, oh, our, our slot's only an hour, not two? Uh-oh, I better cut some stuff down. Uh, but we're going to be talking about a lot of different stuff as it relates to our place in the world of wrestling YouTube and, um, you know, what we see as fans, how fans see us, how wrestlers see us. That, I think, is the most... That's what I'm looking forward to the most, is hearing us all share stories about how wrestlers have responded to our videos. Because, you know, a lot of times, you know, we'll praise wrestlers, or we'll bash them, or in the case of Matthew, they'll show things where they screw up. Um... So, you know, there's a lot of stuff to, to unpack with that, just to talk about the state of wrestling YouTube and YouTube in general, um, just discussing YouTube's future, that sort of thing. Um, also, the plan right now is, uh, right now, is because I meant to, I, I'm trying to put it out earlier for the show, but it's not going to work out that way, I don't think. Uh, I'm going to be debuting a world premiere of a new music video happening uh, that's going to be debuting at... Internet Darlings, yeah, internet, 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 yeah, let me say it again, Internet Darlings 2, UK Boogaloo on September 8th. The live audience will get the first crack at seeing this music video, and then, you know, a few days later, I'll, I'll release it to the public at large at, uh, on YouTube. Uh, but I'm very excited about that project. It's involving a lot of different people, and I think people are going to like what we want to put it out. Um, so, yeah, there's going to be some laughs, there's going to be some... 
time to talk is just about, you know, wrestling YouTube and wrestling, uh, our favorite things about wrestling. It's just going to be a bunch of, you know, uh, you know fanboys congregating and, and talking about the thing they love. So I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be a busy week for me because Labor Day weekend, I'm going to be in Oregon for the West Coast Wrestling Connection for my TV tapings as commentator. And then right after that, I'm flying to England and I'll be doing sightseeing in London for a few days, and then that next weekend's Manchester, and I'm flying right back to Reno um, afterwards. So it's going to be a wild uh, week and a half or so, and I'm really looking forward to it. Well, definitely safe travels to you, and I'm hoping that it does become as big a success as the original Internet Darlings was last year. So before we close out, uh, this is usually the time where I allow my guests to do a lot of the plugs. Now, obviously, we did incorporate, you know, uh, internet darlings too but honestly anything that you would like to add on Mr. Mr. Yeah. Zane well you know for those of you who are listening who are unfamiliar uh, I'm Brian Zane from the channel Wrestling with Regret on YouTube and that's Regret with a W at the beginning for alliterative purposes and uh, I put out several videos a week about WWE stuff, about just wrestling history in general, whatever's on my mind usually. I do classic pay-per-view reviews as well as the modern stuff and I look at silly angles and storylines and characters in wrestling and wrestling and pop culture as well. Um, and so those those videos come out multiple times a week. Just find me on uh, YouTube and subscribe. I'm also on Twitter at Z-Man Brian Zane and my Facebook page, you can check me out, is facebook.com slash wrestling with regret. And my t- T-shirt stores, prowrestlingtees.com slash wrestling with regret. Um, what else? Then there's the UK show happening. Uh, WCWC, you can catch me there in Oregon, September 1st and 2nd. And if you live in the Portland area, you can watch me doing commentary every Saturday night at 11 on Channel 13. Um, that's KPTV, or, yeah, K- KPTV, uh, Point two or whatever, and uh, or Fox twelve plus one. I don't know. It's one of those secondary sister stations. And uh, but of course, if you're not in the Portland DMA, you can catch the, my uh, my my stuff in the WCWC on TitleMatchWrestling.com. Uh, See the TitleMatch Wrestling or TitleMatch Network. It's a Title Match Network. It's a streaming service. So you can check out WCWC plus a whole slew of other independent promotions streaming there on the network. Um, so yeah, that's all I have to plug. <laughs> All right, sweet. Well, of course, you guys can always follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and as well here on Spreaker.com. You know how to do that. Thank you, Brian Zane, for your time on this, well, again, we'll call it the SmackDown pre-show. I think that we did maybe a as credible job, if not subpar job, to the SummerSlam pre-show, but, you know. Just like 3D graphics. <laughs> Just, yeah, <laughs> this is very true. I have, I do have a budget, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen. So <laughs> thank you guys so much for joining us here. So for Brian Zane, I've been Nate the F and Great. Thank you so much for listening to The Game Changer. And also, Mr. Zane, God help you when you have Cultaholic and, wa- and Russell talk together in the same room at the same time. Because I know that heat between the two of them is going to be nuclear. So, guys... I, I, will, I will do my best. I'll have, I'll have cups of water to splash at them to break things up. <laughs> All right, guys. So, thank you so much. Enjoy SmackDown tonight. I'll talk to you guys in the next episode. Bye-bye.